I'm not trying to be crazy and opinionated and controversial and all the rest of it. I am trying to be sensible and measured. However, because the world is crazy, some of the perspectives that I have on health, I think do sound kind of crazy and controversial. Let's kick it off with the first one, which is mouth breathing is as bad as eating junk food. The thing that tells you you need to breathe if you try and stop consciously stop breathing is actually your body's perception that there's too much carbon dioxide. If you feel like you have too much CO2, it feels like you're dying. Only time you want to be breathing through your mouth is if you're talking. Most people massively overemphasize food quality and ignore air and skin toxicity. Filtering your air is possibly actually more beneficial than eating organic food. The line between foods, supplements, and drugs is not real. Why is Pilot Pass a supplement? and rapamycin in a drug. It's, it's purely, it's arbitrary. It's just because they decide it. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Elwin Robinson. And today we are discussing Elwin's most controversial opinions. So please tell me, Elwin, why did you feel it's important that we discuss this with our listeners today? Yes, yeah, good question. Well, uh, one of my favorite YouTube comments, you know, we get a few people giving very nice YouTube comments. One of my favorite was uh, saying that, you know, it's one of their favorite health podcasts and that they love it because I have a sensible perception of health, <laughs> uh, perspective on health. And it's my favorite comment because that's really what I'm going for, sensible. I think it's the only use of the word sensible in all my YouTube comments, but I love it. Um, and that is what I'm aiming for. You know, I'm not trying to be crazy and opinionated and controversial and all the rest of it. I am trying to be sensible and measured um, and accurate and helpful and all that kind of stuff. However, it because the world is crazy, because, you know, there are a lot of, um, what's the word, misperceptions in the world and cognitive dissonance and beliefs and biases and maybe people who, who are pushing perspectives that are not accurate for the sake of profit and all of that kind of stuff. Nonetheless, some of the perspectives that I have on health, I think, do sound, you know, kind of crazy and controversial. And, uh, you know, we did a few videos before that were very popular about, um, you know, I think it's called something like the controversial and interesting opinions of uh, Dr. AP. And we did uh, the controversial and interesting theories of uh, Dr. Buteko and maybe some other people. So I thought, well, actually... Why not the controversial <laughs> uh, opinions of me? Let us uh, let me put it out there and share my craziest perspectives with you. Um, so, you know, maybe you'll think that I'm not that sensible after all after listening to this episode, but hopefully, and I, just like I say, whenever I have these people on which have some out there opinions, I just would uh, ask you to keep an open mind and to uh, be open to the possibility that I may have a point with what I'm saying. And if you disagree, that's okay too. Beautiful. Yeah, well said. And the thing is, you know, these are, you know, things that you've discovered over the time. And, you know, as we all do, as we move through life and we educate ourselves and we have our experiences, there are things that we come to know through our experiences. So, and the other part too, which I, I enjoy about this is that new ideas coming to you can challenge you. Sometimes they can throw you off what you've known, which can be a little scary sometimes. But it's also information for you to decide, is this is this serving to me? Is this relevant to me? Could this help me? And really, you know, figure out and ask yourself those questions as you move through them. Yeah, and absolutely. Everything I'm sharing here is not to be controversial. I've probably already said most of these in other episodes, to be honest. But I wanted to put one together that was, you know, all of the most controversial perspectives, which I actually think, and I hope you agree, when you listen to them are eminently sensible. So let's see. Perfect. Let's kick it off with the first one, which is mouth breathing is as bad as eating junk food. So I want to ask you, you know, when did you first um, come about this opinion, you know, this 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 opinion or this understanding, and what was it that really struck you about it? Well, I first came across this perspective from the work of uh, a guy called Buteko, I think Vladimir Buteko, who was a Russian scientist um, back in the USSR. I think he started around the uh, 50s, 1950s or 60s time. Um, there's a very interesting story related to him, and I won't go into it in depth because we already did a whole episode on this. So I think we're going to be referring to a lot of episodes here as well. But in a nutshell, what he kind of realized and decided was the crucial importance of carbon dioxide as a nutrient. Now, this is not something that is 
Mm, what's the word? This is not something that he discovered because this was actually already discovered back in 1904. There's this undisputed fact in biology, which I think is called Bohr's Law, B-O-H-R, which says that you need carbon dioxide to transport oxygen from the red blood cells to the mitochondria of your cells. So you get oxygen, yes, from breathing in through the lungs and the lungs transport uh, the oxygen to the red blood cells, and then the red blood cells transport it throughout the body through the uh, cardiovascular system, through the arterial system. However, the journey does not stop there. And in fact, it is possible to uh, asphyxiate. It is possible to uh, not have enough energy because there is not enough fuel if you cannot get the oxygen from the red blood cells into the mitochondria themselves. And so it is possible to have an abundance of oxygen and still asphyxiate in reality. And so the thing that is needed is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is perceived to be a waste product. In fact, I think I have another uh, crazy opinion in related to that that I wrote you down do, for you. Definitely, which is the number one nutrient most people are deficient in is CO2, which people would just go... How can that be? Isn't it a waste product? You know, how do we utilize CO2? We're breathing that out. We don't need it. Yeah, absolutely. As I say, I think uh, Buteco really popularized this idea, but Dr. Ray Pete, who I know a lot of people who watch or listen to this are, you know, fans of or at least familiar with his work, he also emphasized the crucial importance of CO2. He came from a bit of a different perspective. Not that they disagreed, he was just looking at it from a different angle. Uh, but they both agreed about this central importance of CO2. So yeah, let's explore it a little bit. So, and then I'll go back to the mouth breathing thing <laughs> to exactly, kind of uh, yeah. round off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've forgotten about that bit. So the most efficient way that your body can create energy and the way that it creates the most energy um, is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation, which is where your body will take a glucose molecule it will um, interact with an oxygen molecule and it will go through a whole Krebs cycle. It goes through this uh, electron transport chain. And the bottom line is your body can get, um, I believe it's 19 units of ATP for every one unit of glucose. So it's a very efficient, efficient and abundant form of uh, energy production. And when the vast majority of a person's energy is being produced that way, they will feel generally good. That's really the basis of what both uh, Buteco and uh, Dr. Pete has in common is that belief that that was like the, the best way of producing energy. And it's not, how do I put this? It's not something that mainstream science actually disagrees with at all. They just don't emphasize it and focus on it. But I think everyone would, you know, every biochemist would agree that is technically the most efficient way of creating energy. So the other way that your body can make energy from um, carbohydrate from glucose is known as glycolysis. And the difference is in why does the body have this backup way? Because if there's not enough oxygen, if there's an anaerobic environment, then your body uses glycolysis. And um, it can make only, I believe it's uh, one unit of ATP per unit of glucose. So you can see there's a huge difference in the amount of cellular energy that can be produced. But that's actually only one of the reasons why glycolysis is inferior to um, oxidative phosphorylation. And possibly the even more important one is that the byproducts of each process. So the byproduct of the process of doing it well is carbon dioxide and water. The byproduct of doing it inefficiently um, is lactic acid. And so when there is this buildup of lactic acid in the system, that's where a person uh, you know, can experience pain and fatigue. And where this happens with everyone is during intense exercise. When, because that's when you run out of, um, that's when you run out of oxygen, right? If you're breathing, you know, if you're running, I know you run regularly, Chrissy, and you know, you're really pushing yourself and you're breathing hard, and the reason that you're breathing so hard is because you're trying to get enough oxygen and you're not managing it. And that's why eventually you'll feel burning, right? And you'll feel fatigued and then you'll have to stop or slow down or, or do something because that lactic acid has built up too much. I think we're all familiar with that. 
Well, there are a certain category of people who, from a medical point of view, make up a tiny minority, but from a broader point of view, might actually be quite a lot of people who do too much of their energy production that way. And that is why they have a tendency to be in chronic pain. And that is why they have a tendency to be in chronic fatigue, because they're doing too much of their energy production the anaerobic way. And what would cause them to do it? Do their, their energy production that way? That's a good question. The most obvious um, interpretation for that was just that there's a lack of energy. So the simple way of, sorry, that there's lack of oxygen, right? Because that's what we're saying. There's a lack of oxygen in the cells. And so one way of looking at that is just breathe more. But the challenge is the issue of the CO2, needing the CO2 to transport the oxygen from the red blood cells to the cells. So if you don't have enough CO2 in your system to transport the oxygen from the red blood cells to the cells, then you're going to use this backup system of utilizing the glucose, where then carbon dioxide is not a byproduct, which then means you have less carbon dioxide. So you can see how potentially vicious that cycle. becomes a, a vicious cycle. Exactly. So the thing that Buteyko realized, which is really groundbreaking, is that if that there is such a thing, let's put it this way, as CO2 or carbon dioxide tolerance, meaning that there is a certain level of CO2 that I can handle and that you can handle, and beyond that, we start to feel not good and like we need to do something about it. And usually that do something about it is breathe more, breathe deeper, breathe heavier, breathe more quickly. Because uh, the signal that tells you that you need to breathe, let's say if you were to hold your breath right now, if you all want to hold our breath as we're listening to this for uh, just a brief period, it doesn't have to be long. As soon as you get that signal of I need to breathe, what's causing that? So most people's understanding would be the, the thing that's causing that is I'm running out of oxygen but that's actually not correct. The thing that tells you you need to breathe if you try and stop consciously stop breathing is actually your body's perception that there's too much carbon dioxide. And that's why certain breathing practices, like you know, famously the Wim Hof Method, what they do is they, first of all, blow off all the carbon dioxide by hyperventilating for a few minutes. And then if you do that, you can hold your breath for much longer. Because again, the desire to breathe again is not based on needing oxygen. It's based on perceiving that you have too much carbon dioxide. So if all of that is the case, then if a person has a low tolerance to carbon dioxide, what that would mean is that they would tend to overbreathe, blow off too much of their carbon dioxide, and then not have enough to transport the oxygen from the red blood cells to the cells. And then their body is going to be building up more and more acid and creating less and less carbon dioxide, and they end up in this vicious circle. This vicious circle can end up in things like chronic fatigue and chronic pain, but it can also end up in another C word that we're not supposed to talk about. So those cells that start malfunctioning and mutating famously um, do not uh, produce energy in the efficient way. They produce energy in the inefficient way that produces a lot of lactic acid as a byproduct. And so, you know, the many, many, many problems come as a result of this. And we hear people talk about this more and more these days, that metabolic syndrome, metabolic dysfunction is like at the root of so many diseases or mitochondrial dysfunction is at the root of so many diseases. But I think often it isn't understood the actual mechanisms behind that metabolic or mitochondrial dysfunction that's really what i'm talking about here these are the the basic building blocks and you know dr pete focused a lot on carbohydrates as well making sure that there was enough glucose so that the body doesn't have to raise stress chemicals in order to convert other things into glucose and there's you know strong arguments one way or the other about that but that's not one of the things i'm going to be getting into today <laughs> i don't have a strong controversial opinion on that but the thing that i do have a controversial opinion on i guess is how important that carbon dioxide is and how important your tolerance to carbon dioxide is. So Elwin, you're really explaining that so well. And I think a lot of our listeners are going to hopefully have a bit of an aha moment. So I wanted to ask you then, how can we increase our tolerance to, this, to CO2 so that we can help get more oxygenation into our cells? For our, so we have enough energy to run 
the processes in the correct pathway and not the backup pathway? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, if you were to get totally mainstream health advice from you know, pretty much anyone, even someone that's clueless about health as, say, a medical doctor, what would they tend to say to you? I know, it's the controversial episode, right? <laughs> I'm going to say things like that occasionally. Um, they're going to say, exercise more, eat less, and lower your stress. Well, what are the things that uh, decrease our tolerance to carbon dioxide? Stress, overeating, and lack of, lack of regular exercise. So it comes back to those same basic things. Now, that wasn't Buteco's answer, and it's not Dr. Pete's answer, but it is the most obvious answer. The most obvious answer is if you reduce your stress, if you don't overeat, um, and if you exercise regularly, your tolerance to CO2 will increase. That's a tall order for some people in our modern day lifestyles today, I tell you. <laughs> and there are very valid reasons for that. You know, I've talked about that. that I think that might be one of the points I'm, you know, in my list there that I gave you. I don't, I'm not sure what we're going to get to today. But if someone doesn't exercise, I do not call them lazy. I call them unwell. We'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that. So I'm not making me wrong if you don't do any of those things. I know telling someone not to stress is probably gives them more stress. So... I realize none of that is necessarily helpful, but I'm just saying that is the most obvious answer. Um, you know, Dr. Pete's approach was ultimately about lowering stress. He had some kind of novel approaches to do that. And, you know, he has his own body of work that talks about that. Boob Tycho's way was a little bit more direct. He said, if you need to increase your tolerance to CO2, which you almost certainly do, then the way to do that is to expose yourself to more CO2. So basically... A lot of his practice was about learning to hold your breath, holding your breath for a long time, holding your breath while walking, holding your breath while running. And, you know, his students who still currently teach his method, like Patrick McKean, I think is quite well known. Uh, you know, he talks about helping athletes and stuff. And yeah, I mean, the essence of it is learning to not breathe temporarily while you're doing any kind of activity or sometimes while you're doing nothing and, and being okay with it. And over time, you kind of tolerate it better and better. And that was the essence of what Buteco realized. He realized he, he measured all kinds of people from the very, very healthiest, the ast astronauts, the Olympic athletes, all the way to the people literally in hospital who are about to die any day. He, he saw a big cross section of the population. And he saw that the people in peak physical condition were breathed the least, and meaning that they had the highest tolerance of CO2 to CO2 and that the most sick and close to dying breathe the most, meaning they have the least tolerance to CO2. Now, again, none of that is contradicts anything that any medical expert would tell you. The only thing that they disagreed with was his conclusion from that, which is he said, well, if the sickest people breathe the most, why not just take the sickest people and get them to breathe less? And he claimed, and many, many of his followers and students and teachers who teach his method and all the rest claim that that works. All you have to do is breathe less. You're, you will feel uncomfortable because you don't tolerate the CO2. So it's not something for people who want the easy path through life. But I guess if you're close to dying, you're willing to try pretty much anything. Um, and it's not easy. And when I say CO2 tolerance, this is not like, oh, it feels like a bit too much CO2 to me. The problem with CO2 tolerance is if you have too much if you, have, if you feel like you have too much TO2, again, it's, it's really about the, how you feel, not necessarily reality. If you feel like you have too much CO2, what does that feel like? It feels like you're dying. It feels like you're asphyxiating. It feels like you're choking and that you're going to die. And so when we talk about increasing your CO2 tolerance, we are talking about at least getting close-ish to the feeling of asphyxiation, which is not pleasant. That brings me back to um, one of our other episodes where you were talking about somebody that didn't f uh, didn't have any fear or something like that, and it was something yeah. about the breath, wasn't it? That was the Buteco episode. That was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I found that intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because so what you just said though is uh, what I heard was that it's about that you feel you have the too much CO two. So if that's just us feeling, or if it's in our mind, then how? How do we get beyond 
that? Is that is there a psychological breakthrough that comes or is it actually a physical training of the physical form? Let me correct myself. It's not only a feeling. It's based on a biochemical reality. But the point is, the, the point at which you feel like, oh my God, I'm going to die if I don't breathe right now. Actually, if you just didn't, you would be fine for another 30 seconds, minute, minute and a half. So in that sense, it's not real. However, it is real in the sense that, you know, a, a, an Olympic athlete and a person who's almost dying do have a genuine difference tolerance for CO2. So there, there's, there was absolutely a real basis behind it. I'm just saying the feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to die if I don't breathe right now is a feeling because actually there are all kinds of techniques and, you know, Buteco practitioners will teach us sometimes where you realize, oh, actually I can go way longer and I'm, I'm not dead. I'm not even passed out. I'm totally fine. Uh, but uh, so with that, in that sense, it is just a feeling. That's uh, kind of what I meant. So, yeah, um, how do you get beyond that? Uh, as I said, you know, if you're looking at the root issues and it's dealing with the root issues of, you know, stress, overeating, um, being unfit. If we're talking about the kind of Buteco approach, then it's more like tricking yourself. So he would talk about, um, you know, distracting yourself, like, while you're still holding your breath, you might move your body, you might move your head back and forth, you might swallow, you might, you know, start thinking of something, but generally like physically moving about it, you might get up and start walking around and all of those things will distract you for another 5, 10, 15 seconds, just at the point that you thought like, oh, I can't possibly like hold my breath for another second. So, the, you know, there's all those kind of practical stuff. So I talk about that a lot in the Buteco episode and I would refer people to that. Let me get back to the mouth breathing thing. So... What those guys teach is really the only time you want to be breathing through your mouth is if you're talking. There is no other reason to be breathing through your mouth. Um, they, you know, it's funny that the word mouth breather is like an insult that almost everyone recognizes as an insult. I see a lot of like people in Hollywood movies, especially women, are often depicted like with their mouths open, breathing, and I don't know if it's supposed to be attractive, but... Um, it, I'm always like, oh, stop it. <laughs> no, no, I know about this. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, mouth breathing is bad for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's terrible for oral health because it means that the inside of your mouth becomes dry, which means that um, there is less of the alkaline saliva bathing the whole oral area, which means that bacteria are more likely to thrive, create toxins, which are then poisoning your whole body, you're constantly swallowing the saliva containing bacteria, which means it's affecting the whole digestive tract, potentially, depending on how the stomach's doing and various other things. There's this, you know, connection between uh, gum disease and oral infections and heart disease that's, you know, strong enough that mainstream medicine not recognizes it. So there's a lot of uh, oral health, which leads to general health reasons that you don't want to breathe through your mouth uh, during the day or, as, you know, especially at night. But um, the other reason is just that it's far, far easier to over-breathe when you're breathing through your mouth. So, because here's the thing, you have a natural mechanism that stops you over-breathing, and it's in your nose. And so, from a Buteco point of view, if your nose is partially blocked, that's your body saying to you, We're, we are carbon dioxide deficient so we are going to stop you from breathing too much. Right, so that you can replenish and rebuild uh, the stores of the CO2. Yes. It's much easier to breathe uh, too much through your mouth than breathing through your nose full stop. And it's much easier to breathe through a fully... It's much easier to breathe too much through a fully clear nose than a partially blocked nose. And so if your body thinks that you're breathing too much, meaning that you are deficient in CO2 it will block your nose to stop you breathing too much. And so what do we do as a response to our body's desperate attempts to preserve this precious nutrient? We bypass the nose altogether and we breathe, breathe through, through our, our mouth. mouth. Yeah. <laughs> or we, you know, take decongestions and Sudafed and all that kind of stuff to kind of just like, which by the way, like a Sudafed is just a, you know, like an adrenaline thing. It's just like a stress chemical. Because again, if you're in a life or death situation, then you know you do need to uh, be able to breathe more. So we're kind of just um, tricking our body into believing that's going on to, again, force ourselves to be able to breathe more. Um, and that's to assuage a different anxiety. Because again, as I said, if we are, we both need CO2, 
So this is the thing that's hard to get your head around. You can both be, need CO2 and be starving for CO2, and yet at the same time be intolerant of CO2 and have anxiety as soon as your CO2 raises. Wow. And the, oh, the reason you have the anxiety because the CO2 is raising is because when we have too much, we feel like we can't tolerate it. So that t it takes us into that state. We think we're dying. We think yeah. we're asphyxiating. If our stress is high, we've just overeaten, or we're very unfit. Again, those are the three major variables. But again, applies for a lot of people these days, right? Uh, most people, most of the time. So that's that's the challenge. And so if that sounds crazy, like why would nature do that? There's loads of examples of that, you know, like in, in the biological realm and the uh, maybe in the emotional, psychological realm. There's so many people out there who need more love and yet, when people try and love them, like it feels uncomfortable. You know, it's not just CO2. There's <laughs> loads of things that, that we actually need, but when we get them, we feel like, I don't like that. And so, you know, CO2 is only one of those things. And so that's, that's the problem with mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is a way of bypassing your body's desperate attempts to preserve CO2, which is arguably the most important nutrient because... You could say oxygen is the most important nutrient, but generally you're not likely to be deficient in oxygen unless you're in you know, outer space or deep between the earth or in a sealed room for a long time and all the rest of it. That's not really the problem. And in fact, people who live in oxygen depleted environments, so it, people who live very high altitude, all their health outcomes are improved. They're actually healthier. They live longer. Um, you know, pretty much in every dimension, people who live in the higher altitude with lower oxygen are healthier, greater longevity, better outcomes for almost every health condition. So the problem is not a lack of oxygen in the environment. The problem is a lack of oxygen in getting to the cells, which is actually a problem of lack of CO2. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense because you could have the oxygen, but if you don't have the vehicle to take it to get to where it needs to... You know, there's not much else you can do about it. Yeah. And so that I'd say being deficient in that primary nutrient, which drives your metabolism, is more important. I, I would say you're in a better position doing that and eating junk food than you would be mouth breathing all the time and eating so-called healthy food. And some Buteco practitioners really, who you know, have done it a long time, they absolutely emphatically believe in that, really push the envelope with that. I, I knew one of the, you know, Buteco teachers, for instance, who's smoked all day um you know some of them who ate like junk food and ate crap whenever they felt like um you know there was a story of buteco where he believed um he sent all his top students to chernobyl right after the nuclear incident because he believed that they would be totally fine from you know the radioactive waste i mean maybe not right in the blast zone but whatever you know being relatively close like helping people because having that high level of co2 was so protective and if you think about it, if you believe those kind of stories about people having exceptional health, that means, you know, we're, we're talking about the uh, Indian guru or the Buddhist monks or the Taoist monks or whatever, like people who just have almost superhuman levels of health, what could that be down to? Well, a part of that would be an extremely healthy metabolism, such that a very healthy young child might have. Well, what is metabolism? I mean, fundamentally, it's simply down to an optimal functioning of every enzyme, every gene, and every cell of the body. And what does that come down to? All of them having an optimal amount of energy. And what does that come down to? All of them having an optimal amount of oxygen and other fuel, but, you know, oxygen being the most important one. And what does that come down to? Back to CO2. So, you know, CO2 really is extremely crucial. Kind of like the number one building block. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that. And also, too, and this is what I love, is that if your health is suffering, this is free. You can really start to turn yourself around if you start to practice this. Absolutely. I'm gonna. A lot of my other controversial stuff are about <laughs> opinions are about things that you buy. But actually, yeah, we started with the number one, which is 100% free. And you just have to come up against the uh, feeling you're like you're asphyx <laughs> asphyxiating on a regular basis. Yeah, beautiful. Well, Ellen, no, that was really great. And I know we unpacked a lot in that one. So that's really, I think that's the the one that you opened my mind to quite a lot when we when we did those first episodes, because it's like, I really didn't understand that relation. So thank you for that. I really do. I know we need to move on. We've got a list, but 
let me just say, um, on the subject of mouth breathing, uh, James Nestor, he was a journalist, very good journalist, who did a whole book about breathing, and he did a scientific experiment with himself and another person. I think it was 10 days, or he did five days of 100% nose breathing, five days of 100% mouth breathing. He had you know, scientists, doctors test all these different markers um, and you know, ECG and blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. And it was shocking how much less healthy he was with just a few days of mouth breathing versus a few days of 100% nose breathing. So if you are still unconvinced, I won't you know, replicate all of what he did. He's the one who put the effort in. But I highly recommend his book. I think it's one of the first chapters um, on nose breathing If you are and mouth breathing and you're not 100% convinced, fair enough, read that, and I think you will be. Wonderful. So everyone check that out if you want some more information uh, for the evidence on that one. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Uh, moving on to our next uh, next one that you have listed here, which you've shared with me. Most people massively overemphasize food quality and ignore air and skin toxicity. So can you really, you know, define what you mean by, you know, ignore the air and skin toxicity of things that maybe people aren't aware of? Sure. So toxins can come in through all routes into your body, right? Wherever there is, I don't know, a hole, <laughs> wherever there is an intake, toxins may be coming in. Um, and I feel that because of the vast majority of our ancestry, our genetic history, our evolution, the main way that toxins would come in would be either through food or water or actually through the air, but then they would have a very distinctive smell. So smoke, for instance, I think smoke. Uh, a lot of people actually still in less developed parts of the world die of smoke inhalation. I think a lot of our ancestors would have died or been adversely affected by smoke inhalation. So I think some kind of inhalant toxins we are actually attuned to, but um, a lot of them we are not. So the crucial thing is we live in a different world than our ancestors did. In the past, the main things that would kill you would be Infectious disease, although we didn't understand that there was such a thing generally, um, but you know we understood that dirty things, you know, old and rotten things. You can see that still in like Eastern cultures, for instance. They always believe in having everything fresh, even if it was a plant grown in a toxic soup. That's okay, but make sure you you eat it fresh. You don't you know don't let it don't, don't let it leave it to wilt for a few days or whatever. So you know, there's very much an understanding of having things. Um, immediately, you know, eating animals quickly, eating plants quickly, not letting things rot. So that was understood. Um, and then avoiding things that were poisonous, that was understood um, in terms of, again, food and water. So, but there was not a lot of focus on a lot of other factors because they're just things that we took for granted. So uh, in terms of air quality, we just took for granted that, as I said, you know, with the exception of smoke and maybe volcanic smog and, you know, like very specific and obvious things, we took for granted that the air that we were breathing in wasn't full of thousands of novel toxins that we, you know, had no um, evolution history with and no way to deal with. Um, we also just took for granted that the things touching our skin Again, although we would look out for obvious signs like maybe mold or, or dirt or you know insects or you know whatever, um, we would assume that the uh, fabrics or furs or whatever we're using themselves were not uh, 
covered with a huge amount of toxicity. So that's just something that we assumed. Um, and again, we're, even with food, if it wasn't old, then and it was something that we recognised, it wasn't some new plant that, or new animal we never eaten before, we would just again assume that it was safe. And so that's the kind of pre-programming. So when you look at most animals, including most mammals in nature, they spend a lot of time, probably the number one thing that they're spending waking time doing is pursuit of food. Um, second would be uh, reproductive pursuit, although often that's off and on, depending on the season. And then third, it would be um, self-protection, so avoidance of harm. And obviously that you know varies uh, species by species and situation by situation, but those are the, the kind of thing. So have I got enough food, reproductive opportunities, and is there a threat? Is something going to violently attack me, probably eat me? Those would be like the primary things that we would focus on. And so... Uh, and, and maybe fourth place after that would be all the stuff we just talked about, right? Is this poisonous? Is this going to kill me? Is this going to hurt me? And we would recognize that by, again, appearance and smell and maybe taste, you know, bitter taste and all that kind of thing. So noticing none of what I just said, is there any, um, you know, is this cream I'm putting on me like full of poisons? Like is this uh, air, is this water that I'm drinking yeah, it doesn't make me sick straight away, but it's full of plastics, which are going to build up in my body and disrupt my endocrine system and like um, uh, be like es estrogen receptor agonists and all that kind of stuff. Is it going to is it going to mess with my hormones? Like most of these threats that we have today are just threats that none of our ancestors would have recognised as threats. However. When it comes to food and water, we always had the potential for those to be poisonous. And so we kind of are a bit alert to that, especially the more, what's the word, neurotic, cautious, people with a higher disgust. Um, uh, you know, there have been studies shown that people who have a, a more active amygdala and who have a more of a tendency to the specific emotion of disgust, they are more cautious around, you know, is this poisonous? Is this dangerous? Is this going to hurt me? So, you know, there's at least a percentage of the population that's still quite concerned. Is this food poisonous? Is it going to hurt me? But it's just not programmed in us evolutionarily to be thinking, is this clothing I'm wearing going to hurt me? <laughs> we just, because you previously, when you were um, saying what you were saying, you made a really great statement. We just assumed it was safe. And I think, you know, that's the thing. When something's on a store shelf, when it is there, when it's handed to you, when it's coming out of your tap, you just don't, you don't think that there's going to be anything harmful in it. You don't know. You assume it's safe because it's there. It, you know, it's gone through a process. People, you know, may be selling it to you or it's gone through a water treatment plant. It's coming into your into your house through your, your faucet. So you think it's got to be, it should be fine, right? You know, we don't go there. Well, if we do go there, I think the problem is it's quite short-term thinking. So I think, again, you know, most of our ancestors throughout our history would be like, oh my God, new water source might be poisonous, let's test it, right? Maybe one member of the tribe would test it, maybe they test a little bit. But then if like the next day you're fine, you go, oh, you know, well, I'll try a load more. If you drink a load and then you're still not sick, you're like, oh, well, it's safe then. Like it doesn't occur to us that this is going to be accumulating poisons in us over the course of, you know, weeks, months, years, decades, and ultimately completely undermine our health and even kill us, that just doesn't occur to us. But again, it occurs to us a little bit with food and drink, but that's why the opinion I made it especially doesn't occur to us of anything that we put on our skin and anything in our air. And in fact, that is where the toxins are really loaded up because as much as most of these government organizations do a pretty poor job of keeping the consumables that we take in safe and free of poisons, they do a far worse job of um, everything that touches our skin. So from cleaning materials to uh, washing powder and fabric softeners to the whatever they've processed the um, fabrics in that you wear to the flame retardants that they put on, you know, almost bed seating and everything that you sit on and you might touch directly with your skin uh, to the moisturizers, to the shampoos, to the shower gels, to the makeup, to, you know, everything. All of this stuff that is touching your skin is 
like it's actually it's actually amazing if there's ever anything touching your skin that isn't soaked in poisons that your skin is that absorbing. That's the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time. How can you say that oh, when anything synthetic, like cotton, people are like, oh well, I don't use synthetic, I use cotton. Cotton is like absolutely soaked in pesticides as well, you know, like uh, and so what you know, the only the only things that I wear are uh, hemp, linen, organic cotton, silk, wool, you know. I mean, that's it. I just don't have the synthetic things. I don't have cotton. Anything that I'm putting on my skin is like a real thing. Like, I know what every ingredient is and I'm happy with it. The simple rule, I think we talked about this in the detox episode. And by the way, I guess for a lot of these points, there's a whole episode where we go into it in more depth. With this one, it would be our ultimate guide to detox episode. Um, anything you put on your skin, you might not want to put in your mouth, but you should feel fine putting it in your mouth in terms of that you're not going to get poisoned. Anything, if you put it on your skin, then you should be happy with having it in your mouth, um, which rules out most of what most people put on their skin. Because the other part of it too is, in my understanding for the body, is that if it doesn't know what to do with it or how to process it, it just stores it someplace. So it's just kind of packed away deal with it later maybe or not and it's just there kind of forever there are some of those forever chemicals aren't there yeah there, and there's more and more of them building up you know just saw the other day you might see the news article about um how they tested i think it was 25 mice and 50 men or maybe the other way around um their testicles and they found that every single one of them had been contaminated with microplastics and the amount was the interesting thing to me. It was, I think it was um, something like uh, 300, or maybe, yeah, 300 micrograms per gram. So that's like 0.03%. If you imagine 0.03% of your husband's testicles are plastic. 0.03 is not that much, but it means there's more plastic there probably than there is zinc, than there is iron, than there is... You know, all of the selenium, all of the vitamin B12, all these essential nutrients, there's less of that than plastic. But plastic isn't essential at all. In fact, it's just completely disrupting everything and messing stuff up. How do we remove these things? I mean, I know we have our detox guide, but it just, it's like, what are the things, like, would binders pull them out? Is it, a, you know, the diet? Is it something? Like, how can we, one, I know well, we have to stop stop adding them. You I was going to say, so. yeah, all I want to talk about this episode is avoiding right. re reducing taking them in uh, right. but yes we, we do have a, a full guide on again the ultimate detox guide and then like we have another episode on supporting the liver and not getting overloaded and congested um, and i would recommend both of those episodes i just want to touch on the air quality as well as being a huge deal um so this is something that is generally not thought of a lot of people you know who watch podcasts like this maybe they filter their water Maybe they've got a you know, reverse osmosis or a distillery even. Maybe they're only buying organic food. Maybe they're like me and they always check every packet with every ingredient and make sure that there's nothing they don't want in there and all that kind of stuff. And then they breathe normal air. And maybe live in a city or by a road. And it's like, or, or in a moldy building, which, you know, is so common that it may as well be the standard. And so I would say, like, Filtering your air is possibly actually more beneficial than eating organic food and, or, or drinking filtered water as opposed to tap water. I mean, case by case basis again, but yeah, like the air, because the amount of air that you're breathing in, I mean, you know, we talked about air before. If you're extremely healthy, it's maybe four to six liters a minute. If it's, if you're very unhealthy, it might be 15 to 18 liters a minute. That's a lot of liters. That's a lot of liters of air going in and out. Yeah, absolutely. We're breathing more than we're eating and drinking. I mean, we've got our clothes on, we're on things like that. So we're doing that, but, but air is constant. Absolutely. And so, uh, as I said, if you're in the countryside, then, you know, it's more of like a mold thing that's specifically, uh, you know, potentially an issue. Uh, and the mycotoxins they produce, which more and more alternative practitioners, functional medicine practitioners, people like that, are you know, considering to be a root cause of a lot of health issues. Uh, Heavy metals are in the air as well. You know, there's the VOCs, the, um, uh, but, you know, all kinds of stuff. 
And then if you're in the city, then, uh, yeah, there's the uh, more industrial pollution, uh, car um, fumes and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I won't go into a big thing. We did it again in the episode already. But uh, I have, you know, air purifiers in the house. I have, like, a, two high-quality ones, which filter out even the, s small enough to the level of uh, mycotoxins and viruses, which is very, very small particles. And... I would consider that to be, um, again, look, if you can't afford that, then fair enough. But what I'm saying is if you're spending thousands and thousands every year on organic food as opposed to conventional food, which a lot of people do, the whole family, right? It's, organic is often quite a lot more expensive. I'd say spending $500 on an air purifier might actually be a better option in a lot of cases, depending on the specific situation. It's certainly something to consider. Absolutely. That's a really, really, really good point because... I don't know of many people that do have air purifiers in their house, really, these days. And the other option, of course, is to live somewhere more pure. And that's, you know, when I first realized about this, I was living in the third biggest city in Leeds. Now I live in the countryside. Countryside is not perfect either. There's people spraying pesticides because I'm not in the middle of the forest. I'm still surrounded by agriculture. And as I said, there's the chance of mold and all the rest of it. So it's still not ideal. But if you look at air pollution maps, which I would encourage you to do, actually, um, they're easily available then you can see how bad cities are compared to the countryside, even if the countryside is not ideal either. So getting moving out of the city is a big thing for your health. And, you know, people are like, oh, I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to jog or I'm going to whatever, go for a walk. If you're doing that along a busy road, is that really a net positive? It may be, but it's hard to say because the amount of extra toxins you're going to be breathing in is not necessarily actually even a beneficial thing. And ditto for going to a gym. You know, if you're going to a gym in a city with air conditioning, where that air is constantly being recycled through a system that is literally never cleaned in many cases, so all kinds of people's viruses, bacteria, all the rest of it are, like, congregating and joining and mutating to new strains and God knows what. Like, <laughs> There's going to be a decline in gym memberships now. <laughs> Do just research, make sure that they clean their air and they've got great filters. <laughs> Most air purifiers are never clean. You can speak to air conditioning, you know, uh, installers and repairers and all the rest of it. Like, this is something that's, you know, almost never done. So air, pur air purity is a big deal. It's as, as big a deal as food purity. You may say, oh, this is nonsense. Oh, and all this is scam hungry. Well, okay. Then drink tap water. Don't bother with organic food. I mean, I'm just saying it's in the same category. And yet, for some reason, I don't think I've explained why, you know, I think it's way over ignored yeah good point and something you know to to bring and like because i've said this before as we've had discussions it wasn't until i um spoke to a naturopath who opened up my eyes to whatever you put on your skin you really should be able to ingest and that made me start looking at things much differently mm -hmm. yeah beautiful so be the next one that we have all right here we go the line between foods supplements and drugs is not real so i wanted to ask you where did you really first come across this understanding yeah it's a good question i, I first came across it probably back when i was um studying and then recommending uh, tonic herbs to people uh chinese tonic herbs and so tonic herbs in chinese herbalism they're like a special class of herbs that are considered to be closer to food than medicine. So most of Chinese medicine, they do consider herbs to be medicine. Me, and so what's the difference? So I'm not saying this is my definition, but this is their definition. Their definition is that medicinal herbs means that uh, you can eat, you can take too much, you can um, do it too long, and you can it can be inappropriate for you. So meaning medicinal herbs, they might help one person, but they might not be good for the next person. So that's why you need a practitioner from their point of view to deal with medicinal herbs. But there's a much smaller category of herbs that they call tonic herbs. And tonic herbs, the idea is they're as safe as foods. You can use them as abundantly as food. You can use them for as long as food. And they're good for pretty much anyone. So that was the concept. And so from that, I kind of got this idea that, and a lot of time people would ask me still about the tonic herbs. Oh, is it okay to take this with this? And I'm like, you know, like, if you eat a curry, do you worry about like combining <laughs> ginger and garlic or onions and garlic? No, you just throw it all in there. So it's in the same category. Well, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that actually a lot of the culinary herbs um, are actually have quite strong medicinal properties. And then, you know, a few years ago when I started to listen to the carnivore perspective, uh, 
uh, and not just carnival perspective, also people like Stephen Gundry, who talks about lectins. So basically, almost every category of plant food has some kind of comment, uh, um, compounds in which are potentially beneficial, but potentially detrimental as well. And I was very interested to see the carnival perspective is that like the animal foods are actually food because they don't have the plant defense chemicals in. So basically nothing wants to be eaten is the idea, except for maybe fruits and dairy. Those are the only two things that are designed to actually be eaten. In the case of plants with fruits, that's how they reproduce, is that it encourages the animal to consume the plant so that it then spreads the seed wider with a little bit of compost. Okay, great, so that's symbiotic. And then in the case of dairy, obviously, that's a mother's kind of sacrifice to um, allow the growth of her progeny. So, okay. But everything else doesn't want to be eaten. Plants don't want to be eaten either. But plants and animals have different strategies to not be eaten. Plants, it's like to run away, fight back, hide, freeze. But in the case of plants, they can't do any of that. So what they do is they have these plant defense chemicals to try and stop you eating them. And so various different plants have different types of plant defense chemicals. And so some of these plant defense chemicals are have medicinal qualities that are actually very helpful in specific circumstances. Uh, but none of them are, what's the word, 100% harm-free. They all potentially ha you know, have an issue, whether it's oxalates, salicylates, uh, tyramines, um, uh, anthocyanins, uh, you know, like um, all the things that you've heard of, the um, triterpenes, the... Um, uh, or, you know, all of the things that are supposed to be beneficial um, c components of these foods are uh, these plant foods are you know potentially also not great, and so that really expanded my perspective. And it's like, okay, so all of these things that are supposed to be beneficial actually maybe you could say it'd be more accurate to say they're medicinal. So you know, I do a lot of other people's podcasts these days and. Sometimes I talk about, you know, hormones or isolated vitamins or mineral supplements or whatever. And they're like, oh, I'm not a fan of that. Or, oh, you should only be doing that if, you know, you have a, a healthcare practitioner um, prescribe them for you and stuff like that. And I'm always like, you know, fair enough. I always ideally like to test as well as we've talked about and, and not just take things willy nilly. But I said, you know, do you have the same concern about eating a curry? And I said, well, no, or, or chili, let's say. Not everyone likes curry. They said, oh, no, no, that's fine. It's like, okay, well, you realize garlic has a lot of issues. Like, it's very high in this compound called allicin, which is a pretty broad-spectrum antibiotic. Um, it's high in sulfurous compounds, which, you know, can adversely affect the aldehyde gene, which is a very important detoxing enzyme. Some research seems to indicate that they're uh, imbalances of different hemispheres of the brain. It's got this kind of agitating quality to it, which is why in Ayurvedic medicine, they you know recommend not to use it if you're at all in the meditative past because it's like uh, it makes you more aggressive and stuff like that. Like this is not a compound that is free from harm, but we we just eat it like it's like it's no big deal. What's an everyday ingredient in many many cultures? So there's that, and then there's the fact like okay, so there's a lot of things. Let's go back to our curry example. What's pretty much every curry got in? Turmeric, right? This, so let's not even forget about the fact that sometimes it's got lead and all the rest of it. Let's just assume that it is pure turmeric. My question is, why is it if it's in a curry, it's food, but if I put it in a capsule, it's a supplement? Right. And yeah, that's how people are trained. I mean, you know, in Feel Younger, we have um, cinnamon, we have saffron, um, and we have, uh, struggling to think of any others, actually. But there's two, culinary, oh, yeah. Yeah, and, term, and curcumin, of course, turmeric, like I just mentioned. Um, elderberry, I guess that's another one. So if all of these things are okay to have in a food or drink, why is it that they're suddenly in a different category and should be treated as a different category if they're in a supplement? It doesn't really make much sense to me. Either we should treat all food as if it needs to have caution, let, let's say like the carnivores do with pl all plants or you know we can say that we can just freely use those supplements just as we would foods it's it's either one or the other anything else to me doesn't really make sense it's hypocritical now if we add drugs to that equation so melatonin is it a supplement or is it a drug 
Chrissy? That's a great question. I think it's, well, it's sold it as a supplement now. You can just get it over the, you know, on the in shelf. America, in, in America, America oh, you can. Yeah, in, okay. in England, Didn't in England, it's that. a drug. In most of Europe, it's a drug. In most of Asia, it's a drug. I remember in Singapore, it was classified as a drug. Taiwan, is classified as a drug. Thailand, it was classified as a drug. Actually, as far as I know, a lot of the world is classified as a drug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? What about progesterone? We're a big fan of progesterone here. Yeah. Uh, is that a supplement or a drug? In the US, it's sold as a supplement in a lot of the world, but not all the world, it's sold as a drug. Um, what about benfotiamine? Big, big uh, proponent of benfotiamine, one of the most effective things for neuropathy. We're going to do an episode on neuropathy soon. It's just a modified form of vitamin B1 that makes it more fat soluble. Is it a food or is it a drug? Depends what country you're in. Yeah. Definitely. What about uh, rapamycin? I mean, that's definitely a drug, right? That's sold as a drug. Um, but but why is it a drug? It, well, if it's used at the high dose, it's um, so immune suppressive that it's you know used for people who have had organ donations to stop the immune system uh, rejecting the organ. And at lower doses, it's often used as a longevity drug because it, you know, by substantially reducing the activity of the immune system, the idea of Behind it is it, you know, reduces the inflammatory processes that often lead to accelerated aging. It's controversial. A lot of people are not a fan. I personally am not. But anyway, that's a drug. Well, what is rapamycin? So that was discovered in soil. Um, they discovered that um, where it was in the soil, uh, people were not getting this particular issue. And then they kind of researched it and realized it was being created by specific bacteria. They isolated it and then they developed this drug. Okay. So it's basically a byproduct of a bacteria. Well, you know, there's another byproduct of bacteria called Pylopass. Pylopass is um, a specific strain of L. ruteri, which is a very interesting probiotic bacteria, which there's a lot of research behind it. And this particular strain, um, what they do is they breed it and then they kill it. So it's dead bacteria. And they take that, and that's supposed to be very effective for H. pylori infection. I personally have found it to be, you know, very effective, and it's probably one of the first things I recommend for that purpose. Why is pylopass a supplement and rapamycin a drug? It's it's purely it's arbitrary. It's just because it they is. decided. Some, like, someone decided. I mean, there's that great quote by Hippocrates: "Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food." And it goes. It's it's both both ways in that space. Um, who determines what? I guess it's also too in the space and the need for it and how it's being utilized and where we go. But who who gets to decide? Yeah, as I say, it's case by case, country by country. Probably the most criminal version, which we've talked about a lot on this um, podcast, which almost every country agrees on, is that if you take the gland, we talked a lot about plants, but if you take the gland, if you take the adrenal gland, the thymus gland, the brain the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, the intestine, the testicle, the ovary, basically almost every gland or organ of an animal, uh, you can sell that as a food from a butcher or as a supplement if you, if you dry it up and put it in a capsule as a supplement company. But if you take it from the thyroid, it's a drug. That's pretty much everywhere. And, and yet... All of that used to be naturally included in food. People used to regularly eat the whole animal, fish head soup, you know, that's still like a thing in, in Asian countries. So the vast majority of us would have, unless we were vegans, which pretty much didn't exist until very recently, um, we would have had, in most cultures anyway, we would have had some thyroid hormone in our diet on a regular, probably even daily basis because we were eating whole animal foods. And there are stories, you know, about um, more indigenous cultures where if a person was sick, then they would maybe give give them more of the thyroid gland or whatever, stuff like that. Anyway, suddenly the authorities, because it's so effective, they decide it's a drug and now it's illegal to allow it in food. So, you know, the butcher or whatever, if you if you go, can you get, can you sell me a pancreas? Sure. Can you sell me a adrenal gland? Mm unusual but yeah okay i can get it for you you know <laughs> but can you sell me a fire aid no or they'll throw me in jail like that just it's seems actually so illegal. wrong that just seems so wrong because i mean i know we've got the you know we've done the episode on feel younger diet previously and i know we've got one lined up ready to go of really how to put it in practice um 
but like what you're saying and what I'm hearing too is like there's there's so much that we are potentially missing out on those beneficial key parts that we should be ingesting but that we're not that's kind of just been either taken away from us um or that we just don't recognize or notice that we should actually be including yes so let me give a couple more examples and I'll give like a summary of this because like all right what are you getting uh, Ellen okay so one more example is the difference between a sup of a difference between a supplement and a drug let's go back to the plant thing for a second so um we talked about the difference between a food and a supplement when it comes to herbs right if if the garlic is in my curry then it's food if I put it in a capsule it's a supplement right well what about if you take a herb like tribulus or like golden seal or like whatever and you extract a specific part of it or you just standardize it so it has a certain level of that active ingredient in there um you know like even with let's say with like a blueberry let's take that blueberry is a food if they sell it as a supplement they'll say like 40 percent anthocyanins or something like that it's standardized to have a certain level right well doesn't that actually make it more of a drug? Because isn't the whole point about drugs, the reason why pharmacists and doctors think drugs are good and the reason why holistic and alternative people think drugs are bad, because they isolate one component of it rather than giving the whole thing, right? The scientists and the doctors like that because it means it's easier to control and it's easier to understand the effects of it. It's not too broad. Often, like, one compound has very specific measurable effects, whereas the alternative and natural types don't like it for that same reason, because it's very imbalanced. It's only working on one system. You know, all the other stuff that usually comes with it in nature has been stripped away. Okay, so why is it that a standardized herb and a, say, 10 to 1 extracted herb, which is, you know, overall what I'm more keen on, but I take it on a case-by-case -case basis, why are they treated as if they're both supplements? When in fact, the extracted herb is literally the herb as found in nature, or even the food, like blueberries, as found in nature, with just the water removed. Whereas the standardized herb, or the extract, like say berberine, is basically where everything else has been either removed or minimized, so there's only one chemical compound that's being focused on. Well, that sounds more like a drug, right? And yet they're both treated as supplement. Actually, one is more of a food, the other one's more of a drug. They're both treated like supplements. It's just crazy. So, all right. Now I'm going to steal man the other side's argument. Right. So there is a real difference, but the difference is in not in... It's not as obvious as they make it. So the what they make it is, if it's on a plate or in a bowl, it's food. If it's in a capsule and, and uh, sold by a supplement store, then it's a supplement. And if I have to get a prescription to get it or I get it from a pharmacy, it's a drug. That's basically the lines as they are in terms of how people treat it in practice. I would encourage you to look at it differently. I would encourage you to look at it from the perspective that I uh, just said. If it, is, um, if it is in its natural form, then it is a natural compound which is somewhere between food and supplement because the thing you just said like your food be your medicine all the rest of it as we just acknowledged almost every plant and actually even in fact of every animal component has a potentially healing and potentially harming element to it and so really there's no such thing as i mean what there's almost no such thing as a pure food you could say maybe pure muscle meat is you know, just a food, you could say maybe a pure carb or white rice or something with literally nothing in it, maybe a pure MCT oil, you know, something like that. Although with each of those things, you could find arguments for making the medicine. But let's just say, you know, something without any of those kind of active components in uh, where there's really very little of them, you could say that's maybe more a pure food, but almost everything has this medicinal element in. So let's just put that all in one category. It doesn't really matter if it's in your plate or bowl or if it's in a capsule you know does is the vanilla suddenly something that you have to worry about if it's in a capsule but it's totally fine if it's in your ice cream no of course not i mean it's the same it's the same thing and then on the other side if something's a drug or if something's a supplement i think there is a line there that's genuine and i think 
there is some validity despite everything I said about thyroid. I think the reason why things are treated as drugs is if there is a potential for harm with careless use. The problem is some of the things that are treated like supplements really would probably actually more accurately be in that drug category. There are supplements out there if you accidentally, you know, had, the whole, too much. Bowl, yeah. had the whole bowl, you're, you're really going to seriously hurt yourself and create a problem. And actually, there are some things in the category of drugs, although admittedly not many, where it's the other way around if you actually had a load of them that you would be just fine. Um, certainly in terms of some of the stuff we just mentioned, for instance, though, I don't want to mention anything by name. Um, so I, I would look at it more as the case of, can I have it abundantly? Do I need to be cautious with it? Or do I need to be super careful with it? Those would be really the, the categories that I would uh, put it in. And when I say super careful, I would say, do, should I only have this under supervision of someone who really knows what they're doing? And as I said, you could argue that almost everything falls under that last category if you want to be really cautious you know like it, yes including blueberries including almost all the ingredients of curry including almost all the ingredients of chili including almost all the ingredients in a salad you know because they all have these active chemical components in which can have a serious effect on the body um but yeah so that's my reality check and all that that a lot of these lines between them are not real stuff to think about and contemplate for sure <laughs> We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Reikian Bioenergetics is the best thing you can do for your overall well-being. So talk to me a little bit about this one and let me know, you know, where did you come across it and learn about it? And then what was your understanding where you decided, ah, yeah, that, that statement's true for me? Yeah, I mean, these are all statements for me. I'm making these for everyone. Um, right. Obviously, <laughs> the people could disagree. And so let me just clarify first. Bioenergetics uh, is also what Dr. Ray P called his system. I'm not talking about that bioenergetics. Reikian bioenergetics, what I'm calling it, is the kind of the fusion of the work of Wilhelm Reich, who was a student of Sigmund Freud, and then Alexander Lowen, who was a student of Wilhelm Reich, who call, he called the system bioenergetics. They have a lot more in common than they are different from each other. The only main difference is one of them is done lying down, one of them is usually done standing up. But other than that, what are they about? They're about recognizing that there is a connection between how we feel and how we hold our body in terms of chronic areas of muscle tension and also sometimes facility. And that when we hold our body in these certain postures, it's often to protect ourselves from feeling certain emotions. If you can think back to when you're a child, maybe if, if you're ever crying and someone told you not to cry, or if you ever felt afraid and you realized you couldn't show that you were afraid and you had to hide that you were afraid. So if you remember like having to pretend you're not afraid or having to pretend that you're not sad or maybe having to pretend that you're not angry, you had to kind of hold it in and hide it. So that's the kind of genesis of learning to hide how we feel. And that hiding always comes with a bodily component so maybe yeah in your mind you told yourself to focus on something else or yeah you know, survival be, mechanism yeah you might have said to yourself be strong or whatever but 
you will have also held yourself a certain way. You would have, if you, you attempted to cry, you would have stiffened yourself to stop yourself breathing in that way. Um, you know, if you wanted to you like lash out, then you would have had to like hold yourself back from doing that. All of that kind of stuff. If you wanted to shake and tremble, which is a natural approach to fear, you would have had to force yourself not to do that. So all of these are tensions. And so uh, it's funny that a lot of people these days who teach these systems, they don't recognize the huge impact they have on health. But the original teachers I just mentioned, Wilhelm Reich, was obsessed with health. And in fact, later he kind of, he became less interested in this therapy and more of other modalities that he thought were even more powerful for increasing physical health. And Alexander as well constantly talked about physical health throughout his life and throughout all his books and his work. And the connection to me is this. It's very obvious and it's very mechanical. When you have a tendency for chronic tension in a certain area of your body, what that means is that area of your body it's getting less nutrients going in and it's getting less waste going out. Because wherever there's chronic tension, so tension isn't just muscles and tendons and stuff, although it's certainly that, it's also the fascia. And the fascia is this um, very thin, kind of translucent-ish, sometimes white, sometimes yellow, sometimes clearish, uh, and very strong material that kind of coats all the muscles and bones and ligaments and kind of keeps everything together. If you've ever cut up meat, you'll, you'll probably recognize this very strong, thin stuff that you have to kind of cut away, and that's the fascia. And so um, that fascia, along with everything else, can when, it, when, you, when it's tense, when you're tense, it can kind of strangle certain areas of your body. And so... I absolutely believe, Lowen believed, Reich believed, and really anyone who gets into this enough and studies it enough comes to believe that a lot of health challenges, not all of them, but a lot of them, and especially where they are localized. So what do I mean by that? I mean, yes, you know, your toxins, your nutrients, your CO2 that we talked about earlier, all of this stuff your hormones, all of this stuff will affect how you're doing in general. But in terms of where does the problem show up first? Does the problem show up for you maybe as neck stiffness and thyroid issues? That's probably because you've specifically got a lot of tension around your neck. Does the problem you know, show up for you more as digestive issues um, and you know, maybe uh, lower back pain or middle back pain? That's probably because you specifically got a lot of tension around your midriff you know does it show up for you as sexual problems urinary tract problems bladder problems then it's probably because you specifically got a lot of tension around those areas you know etc i won't go on but you get the point right wherever there is especially a lot of tension and a lot of holding um is where there will be especially restricted blood flow going in and out and where you're more likely to have those health issues show up first and of course if you're generally tight and stiff and tense, then you're generally going to have a lack of blood flow. And over time, you're going to have high blood pressure and you're going to have toxins build up and you're going to have nutrients depleted and you're going to have hormonal imbalances because hormones are created by the endocrine, uh, endocrine glands. And those glands, most of them have this muscles and ligaments and tendons and joints and fascia wrapped around them. And so the most common hormonal issues, uh, you know, I guess number one is probably pancreas in terms of insulin. Number two, maybe I'm talking about recognized is, you know, sexual organs uh, around the, the pelvis where there's often a lot of tension. Uh, number three would be the thyroid around the neck where there's a lot of tension. Number four would be immune system issues, which relates to the thymus around the chest where there's a lot of tension. So, you know, these are all uh, areas where tension has a huge impact. And so... That's the first thing to understand. So what do we do about those chronic patterns of holding? There are a lot of systems out there. Most of them are more focused on managing pain. Um, that's usually the primary reason why a person realizes that they have all this tension and, and attempts to reduce it. But you know, some modalities out there are working more from a psychological perspective, like trying to release and undo trauma and emotional repression and stuff like that. Uh, some of them are even working more from a performance perspective, you know, like making you run faster or walk more gracefully or whatever it might be. Where does, quite... a, 
right in bioenergetics really come from its basis? Is it more in the physical or is it more in the mental? So the Reikian initially was um, based on, yeah, psychological. So as I said, Reich was a student of Freud. Um, and so Freud's belief was that sexual repression was the root of most mental health issues. That was the, the big thing. Other than like classifying the subconscious, I think that was like the big thing that he came up with. Uh, Reich went with that, didn't disagree, but then expanded it and realized it's not only the sexual urge that, being held back that's an issue, but it's all of the urges, like the ones I just mentioned, the urge to tremble when you're afraid, the urge, the urge to hit and lash out when you're angry, um, the urge to sob when you're upset, like us feeling like we have to hold those in. Like Freud was around in Victorian times where sexual oppression was specifically, you know, very, very um, high, but generally, you know, I'd say these days it's one of the things, but really just every urge that we have that we tell ourselves that we shouldn't have and that's really what reich realized and what lowen also uh, you know expanded on agreed on so uh, yeah they were coming from a is it primarily psychological one but reich quickly actually transitioned to being focused more on health and lowen was really kind of focused on all of it but i'd say just as much physical health as he was psychological health and he he really saw them being hand in hand a lot of his books are like endless case studies where he talks about, uh, you know, this person had this particular body posture and this particular pattern of holding related to this specific psychological trauma that led to this specific health issue. <laughs> and that was just what it was over and over again. He provides so many different examples of it. Um, and then, you know, once the he helped the person to have less of this pattern of holding in order to repress emotion, then... Or, I guess repress the expression of emotion would be a better way of putting it. Um, then, you know, the person's health issue went away and, you know, it happened over and over again. Because they're, release they're releasing the tension that has uh, stored up there. So then they're opening everything up, which allowing more blood flow, allowing more things, allowing more emotions, uh, those feelings to come through. Yeah, I think from a purely physical perspective, as you just said, relaxing that chronic holding will... From a psychological perspective, what's good about it is that the person starts to feel the feelings that they've been avoiding their whole life and they become a more complete person and more authentic and blah, blah, blah. But from a physical point of view, we don't care about any of that. All we care about <laughs> is that suddenly the blood's getting in, the nutrients are getting in, the lymph is flowing out, the toxins are getting out, and whatever that area is starts to be able to function correctly again. And rather than building up lactic acid, um, and uh, because of, again, lack of oxygen, we talked about with the first point, um, and, and therefore, you know, pain and fatigue in that area and stiffness and all that the rest of it, it just starts, you know, working correctly again. And even if it, you may only have tension in one area, the neck, but then that tension will also constrict the thyroid, which means that the thyroid's working so optimally, that means there's not enough thyroxine, that packs every cell in your body, and then... So then a local issue actually becomes a uh, global issue. And that's true for, you know, pretty much every gland, every organ. It affects every other gland and every other organ. So you only need one specific pattern of holding in one area to completely massively downgrade the operating capacity of your whole body. And then let me ask you this. Why Reiki and bioenergetics over, let's say, something like yoga? Yeah, it's a good question. So yoga's goal is not to undo those patterns it's it has a very different goal yeah you know its goal really is um spiritual enlightenment that's yeah. settle that's the what mind it's... get ready for your shavasana your your meditation yeah i mean it's you know there's the eight limbs of yoga i assume the type of yoga you're talking about is asana which is like different postures right uh different stretching and holding and the rest but yeah i mean the ultimate goal is nirvana which is uh you know union with uh, the all and so uh, everything I just talked about is not really part of that. Now, it may sometimes happen as a, a side effect or a consequence anyway, but it's not really the goal. The goal of the... The difference is the goal of yoga is to transcend, whereas the goal of something like this is to be fully in your body and present in your body and authentically feel things. You know, it's a it's a different goal. Um, you know, the, the, the goal of yoga is very much, you know, like raising the kundalini up and going out of the body and like you know experiencing stuff like that although there is a grinding component as well but with the reiki and it's all grounding it's all about let's get me out of the afer let's get me out of being disassociated and into my body present 
fully feeling, um, yeah, so into the body as opposed to out. Let me also, because then also when I was just reading a passage in The Body Keeps the Score, and it just really stuck with me, whereas like when you ask somebody like how they're feeling, they go, I don't know, I don't know. It's because they're numb. They're so dissociated. And in order to potentially then eventually reach that nirvana and that enlightenment, we got to bring you back in so you know what you're doing and what you're feeling. So then you can have the ultimate transition potentially. That's where I w would go with that. We got to come this way first. So then we can have the full complete. I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think, yeah, a lot of spiritual systems don't necessarily agree with that. You know, they are, and, and even if they agree with it philosophically, the practices they're teaching are just increasing disassociation rather than embodiment. So that's why these kind of practices, and you know, it's not the only one. And maybe the ones that are more embody focused and earthing focused would be maybe more like Taoist practices and you know, maybe martial arts and all of that kind of stuff, because that's much more practical and earth focused as opposed to enlightenment and other focused. But, you know, they have a different perspective. Again, it's either a martial perspective or it's a very much a like self-control perspective. And all of that is often just increasing the tension in the body. What spiritual practice do you know that is encouraging you to fully feel your feelings um, authentically and, you know, without repressing? Like e almost every spiritual or even athletic or bodybuilding or i'm trying to think of they're, they're all down. about yeah. yeah how to control yourself in yeah. various ways and there's a place for that we talked about that in other episodes on personality about how maybe it isn't ideal if everyone goes around totally freely feeling everything and there's a place for a certain amount of rigidity and all the rest of it but when the level of self-control and rigidity gets to the point where it is chronic so in other words you can never stop doing it you can never relax you can never let go you can never honestly express your feelings um, and if it gets to the place where it's pathological meaning you're doing it so much that it's causing disease and imbalances in your body then it's a real problem and unfortunately a lot of those other systems um sometimes they do help with that i'm not trying to minimize it but overall my experience has been uh, they are not as effective as something whose primary goal is to help with that. Which, you know, and there are other things whose primary goal is to help with that. Why do I think bioenergetics and Reiki therapy, kind of the same thing, are the best or better? Um, and I give some other examples of things that work through a very similar mechanism, like counter strain is one of them, works for a similar mechanism, something called Hannah Somatics that works for a similar mechanism. The mechanism they all share is they're kind of, Instead of trying to, instead of seeing that you're tense and trying to relax, which is what most things like stretching or uh, osteopathy or chiropractic or whatever it might be uh, based on, this is based on making your body aware that you have a pattern of holding tension by actually increasing the tension. So that's the difference. So that and so that your brain becomes aware and then showing your brain how it can relax, but showing it that it's tense by increasing the tension first is what those few modalities have in common and that certainly the, the bioenergetics do. I think the, the best question is, if, Elwin, if it works so well, why isn't it more popular when it's like, you know, over 100 years old, um, at least the Reikian one, I guess bioenergetics is, I don't know, 60 years old, something like that. And the answer to that is because it's very difficult. Again, it's a little bit like the Buteyko. If the Buteyko is so powerful, why doesn't everyone do it? Because Because it most requires people... hard work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it requires hard work is a bit flippant. Um, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying it's beyond that. It re like the Buteyko requires like facing the feeling of asphyxiation. I might die. And then the bioenergetics involves facing whatever feelings you have been drip, like trying your whole life to avoid. And for different people, that's different feelings. If you were told you must never be angry, which is a certain personality type, then feeling anger feels like, oh my God, it's rage. I'm either going to kill myself or everyone around me. This is too dangerous. I cannot let myself feel it. For some people, it's shame. You know, we talked about this before. There are many cultures still around today where people would really literally rather kill themselves or their loved ones than feel shame, you know? Uh, for some people, it's fear, you know, it's terror, it's existential, it's the worst feeling in the world. For some people, it's sadness, because to them, it's not just sadness, it's futility, it's despair, it's, the, it's not, not annihilation, it's the worst possible feeling in the world. So whatever to you is the worst possible feeling in the world, 
or th- maybe you got several, maybe it's disgust, you know, maybe it's guilt, whatever is the worst, or and some people it's joy, you know, it's kind of miserable people who never seem to smile, never feel happy. They cannot let themselves feel joy uh, because, you know, whatever, there's a feeling of if they do, it's again, the worst thing in the world. And so um, avoiding feeling those things is immensely costly in terms of energy and tension and all the rest of the stuff we just talked about. But if, if feeling it w- feels like a fate worse than death um, and the only way to kind of be free is to not try and feel it but just do physical movements that will probably as sooner or later at some point make it come up, um, it's very hard to stick with those things, you know, until it works and then continue even after it works. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked about this in detail in the episode where I recommend these practices, but just in a nutshell, you know, it was originally conceived by Reich that, you know, obviously, as I said, he was a student of Freud. Freud was the pioneer of talk therapy. Um, Reich and Lowen both said, you know, you need to do it alongside talk therapy because the feelings that are going to come up sooner or later if you do it properly are so intense that if you don't have someone to talk about it with who really gets it and who is neutral and who's compassionate and all those things, then it can be overwhelming. And honestly, my experience, Christy, is I kind of do it periodically and I do it to the point where feelings start coming up and then and they're bearable and processable. And then I stop for a while and, you know, wait until I feel great again. But the difference is every time I do it, I feel a little bit greater you know, for a while afterwards. And honestly, the motivation to do it again is less and less because it's like, why would I make myself feel bad when I'm feeling happier and happier, happier than I've ever in my life? But the answer is two things. First of all, if if I'm wise, then I go, you know what? Uh, I'm getting better and better. This is helpful. But probably actually is usually not that. What it actually is, is my body will tell me it will, it will create some pain or it will create some something and i'm like oh god i know what this is this means i have to do more bioenergetics it's like my body saying i'm ready for the next level and so then i do it and usually nothing happens at the time for me but it's like a day later two days later a week later something like that then suddenly there'll be all this upset and it will and i have to be present enough and be aware enough that it's not because of the present situation it's because some old feelings are coming up and again that's where it can help to have someone to talk to who can remind you of that and help you through it. Um, and look, that's my process. I've had some really horrific things happen to me. I can say that now. You know, I never used to say that. Is it worse than you, listener, viewer? Quite possibly not. I'm not saying that, but it, it's pretty bad. Um, I think if what you've been through is more moderate, it actually doesn't take that long and you've really cleared that backlog. But if you've got, you know, especially early childhood of, you know, lots of severe life-threatening traumas and all the rest of it and you know and plus you know continual chronic abuse going on decades and all the rest of it then yeah it just takes a while but even just clearing a bit of it in my experience has more impact than you know most um most other health things put together (laughs) and which is why i made my controversial statement um the exception to that would be someone who really has had a very emotionally healthy and balanced upbringing, but who nonetheless has a lot of unhealthy lifestyle habits. That's the kind of person who the statement I made would not be true for. But then even in that case, I have to ask, why do you have so many unhealthy lifestyle habits? If you had such a great, happy, healthy and balanced childhood, wouldn't you be making wiser decisions wouldn't you not be doing whatever it is overeating drinking smoking workaholicking not sleeping whatever it is choosing the wrong partners exactly yeah yeah (laughs) now that's not guaranteed because sometimes people just make mistakes out of innocence and naivety and this is possible but so i don't i can't remember what my opening statement was but maybe it's not for everyone but um the majority of people and certainly at the people i ever speak to meet who come and see me, they're usually people who have had long-term chronic health issues. They're often people who've tried a lot of stuff and had it not be successful. So every one of those people, bioenergetics, you know, would be more helpful than probably everything else they're doing. 
Great one to um, unpack for sure. And we'll put the links below for you guys to check out the more in-depth episodes on those and some links to the exercises themselves. Um, so next, moving on. I like this one. So it's an interesting one to talk about because we've done a couple episodes around it. So, and I'm glad we're bringing it out to the forefront. Everyone, almost everyone with chronic health issues needs thyroid support. So here I go, you know, when people talk chronic health, they're not going to automatically go to, ah, you need thyroid support. So talk to me how you came to this conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot of it is experience, not just theory. I just see it again and again and again. Um, so yeah, the crucial thing there is chronic health issues. And especially if it's a specific type of chronic health issues. If it's a combination of, let's say, not necessarily everything I'm about to list, but most of them. And most people do have most of them, it seems. So if a combination of fatigue, anxiety, depression, digestive issues, chronic infections, allergies and or intolerances, skin issues, um, and other, especially sex hormone issues, um, and feeling cold. That would be the combination. Again, you don't have to, have to say yes to all of those, but if it's two thirds plus, then that gives me a great indication that thyroid would be one of the essential places that you need to start. So why is thyroid so important? We've done, as you said, we've done a lot of episodes on this. I'm, so I'm going to try and buzz through this one quickly. But when you have um, an issue of your thyroid, why might you have an issue of your thyroid? We have to go through my whole rejuvenate blueprint. It could be genetic issues. It could be nutrient deficiencies. It could be toxins impacting your thyroid. It could be other hormones affecting it, like too much cortisol, uh, for instance, is a very common one, too much estrogen is another one. It could be lifestyle factors. Um, it could be, you know, including the chronic tension that we just talked about. It could be a chronic infection, or that's probably the least uh, likely cause of it. Although it does happen, like with, um, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, different things that affect the, the throat specifically. Um, and then it could be um, uh, emotional issues. So... Uh, and, you know, as we talked about how they would affect the body in a direct physical manner. So the reason why I would start with that is, first of all, as I said, I just see it over and over. Um, second of all, because when you have those chronic health issues, especially a lot of the ones that I just listed there, that's often a sign that the person is running on adrenal energy. When you're running on adrenaline, you your body goes, okay, we are in a scarcity situation. The person doesn't have enough time to rest optimally. The person doesn't have enough time to fuel themselves optimally. The person doesn't have enough space to you know, be emotionally supported optimally. But what they do need to do is survive. And quite possibly, depending on context, sometimes but always reproduce. Ironically, actually, if the body considers the threat to be extreme, it's actually more likely to go into reproductive mode. Um, so people who like really, that's why, you know, ironically people who have low level stress and anxiety that's constant, but never like absolutely insane often have reduced sex drive, but people who literally believe they've only got a few months to live, <laughs> this is the opposite. They actually get a really, or people who are always acting like it, uh, like your Charlie Sheens or whatever, you know, people who are like always on um, the edge of <laughs> edge of death um, with their uh, antics and their drug intake and, uh, you know, whatever. That can often make you hypersexual, they call it, but it tends to be one or the other. Anyway, so, but generally it's um, reproduction and survival. And survival functions are like the function of the brain being able to focus and be able to think quickly. Um, they're the heart being able to be, the lungs to be able to go, the musculature to be able to function. And so how does that translate in the real world? It means that you probably, until eventually maybe you can't, but probably for a long time, you're still able to go to work, you're still able to get things done, you're still able to cross off your to-do list, um, you're still able to function. But what are considered non-essential functions to the adrenal system? or lower lower levels of essentialness functions like digestion 
functions like immunity, functions like detoxification, functions like reproduction, usually, as I said, not quite always, um, functions like, yeah, the health for the maintenance of the skin as well, which is actually quite a, an energy and nutrient hungry organ, as we uh, you know covered recently in one of our episodes. Um, and so that's what, and, and also functions that even brain wise are more long term beneficial, like memory. Uh, and that's why we'll notice other than the most obvious factors like um, feeling cold, which doesn't always happen because often actually being cold instead of your actual temperature and feeling it do not necessarily coincide. But overall, still, I find that people with low thyroid function will be the ones who are most likely to reach for, you know, an extra layer before the other people around them. So overall, it works. Um, all of those functions that I just said that are considered luxuries from the adrenal point of view, they're all the ones that tend to suffer in people with these chronic um, thyroid conditions. And so we ask, well, why is the person in an adrenalized state in the first place? And there could be a lot of reasons for that. But then if we ask, well, how do we get them out of that adrenalized state and get them back into feeling like um, everything's okay and all of those so-called luxury functions of the body, how do we get them working properly and optimally again, like the digestive system, the immune system, and the hormonal system, and all the rest of it? Um, well, we need to give them enough energy because when we're in the adrenal state, there's only enough energy for the survival systems again. And so how do we get enough energy? Well, the thing that tells the mitochondria to produce more energy for every system in the body, not just the emergency systems, is the thyroid. And so that's the thing that I would want to look at and what I want to start with. And I won't say too much more about that controversial opinion because we just did an episode on that recently we that did. I recommend to people called Wilson's Temp Temperature Syndrome, actually. I don't know if it even has the word thyroid in the title. So look for the word temperature, maybe. Wilson's Temperature Syndrome. But that really explains why a lot of people, even though they may not have medical hypothyroidism, still realizing that a issue of metabolism related to the thyroid could be the root cause and even if there is more to it even if there's also the you know nutrition and detox and lifestyle and this and that by supporting the thyroid usually temporarily is all that's necessary you can kind of kick start the whole system again increase the body's energy production back to optimal which allows the adrenal system to calm down and then once everything is functioning optimally once the adrenal system can calm down then it's much easier to go, okay, what's still left? Oh, I've still got, you know, this, I've still got that. So I, there's still stuff I have to resolve. But um, the other thing, the, you know, the two things I didn't mention there, you know, um, was depression and anxiety. So anxiety obviously comes from a position of being over-adrenalized, that feeling, you know, always being on the edge of overwhelm, always like hypervigilant, thinking there's always a problem, there's always a threat, there's always something to do. But depression, let me just touch on that for a second, um, so depression is often a response of when that situation goes on too long of low levels of energy. We can either go into a state of constant adrenal activity, and some people do that, especially if they have their genetic tendency. But more common is that they go at least sometimes, sometimes all the time, into a kind of conservation state where it's just like almost hibernation, where it's just let's do as little as possible until there's more energy available. And that's what I call the depressed state. That's what I think the root of most depression really is. Um, and my evidence for that is a study I saw recently that said that um, over 90% of people with severe, diagnosed with severe or moderate depression had low levels of T3 in their blood tests. And supplementing with T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, uh, gave better relief from their symptoms of depression than any antidepressant. So again, I think thyroid function is crucial. So that's why I said chronic health issues, and especially, as I said, if you relate to a lot of them. If you only have depression and none of the others on the list, or if you only have digestive issues and nothing else on the list, it may well be something else, right? I'm not saying that it's definitely that, but I'm saying when you can tick, you know, as I said, two-thirds plus of that list, which honestly most people I see can, then that's just the typical pattern of, I have a lot of chronic health issues and the thyroid is usually at the root of it. Beautiful. Yes, everyone do check out that Wilson's episode. There's a lot more information in there too, because even though some of your blood tests may be coming back, you know, really it's about checking your temperature, 
which is a big key. And thyroid is so, so, so important. So I'm really glad that you brought that episode to us, Ellen, because that was very, very informative. Well, Ellen, I know we didn't get through the list, so we'll definitely be bringing a part two at some point to our lovely listeners. But this has been really, really an opportunity for discussion, which is what I like and what I like. I know we want to bring to our listeners that are showing up because we're bringing new thoughts potentially or thoughts they may already have and opinions they may have, but you know, they don't hear them around so much. So uh, before we close, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, I'm a bit kind of self-aware at the moment. I think uh, if you feel like I didn't do justice to any of these concepts that you already know, or if you feel like they didn't make sense, if you don't already know them, then I probably agree with you. Uh, please forgive me on that and check out, we have a full episode on, uh, I think, each of these concepts. Uh, watch that. I think I probably do a much better job of explaining it when I have more time to do it. Uh, but so just you know, treat this as a bit of a general introduction to the topic. But I hope you enjoyed it anyway. And yeah, I still appreciate your feedback. As I say, I'm not saying that to preempt any criticism. Feel free to give me any criticism. I'd still love to hear it. Um, but yeah, I really wanted to introduce these concepts. These are life-changing concepts to be, you know, very serious for a second. These massively made a difference to me, but not just me, they've massively made a difference to a lot of people. None of what I'm sharing is stuff that, you know, I'm genius enough to come up with, honestly. All of this is stuff that um, people smarter than me have already worked out, and I'm just happy to, you know, be able to share them with you um, because, you know, I would like to bring them to a, as large an audience as possible because each of these concepts is potentially life changing on its own. And if you apply all of them, you should be having fun. Yeah. And as you said, you know, of going back to um, the Reiki and bioenergetics, it's been around for a very, very long time and not very many people know about it. I mean, you were the first one that introduced it to me and it's like, oh, wow, I can't believe this is out there. I had no idea. So, you know, the more um, that we can bring these kind of things to the audience, you know, it can help support them in ways that they didn't know. So this is, you know, very valuable. And again, to our listeners, thank you. We love having you here. Please let us know if there's more you want us to discuss or, you know, or as Alwyn said, if there's anything that you want to point out to him. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. And please make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.